For the peoples of the Mandara Highlands, the Hide, Martha, Serac, and others, the highlight of their ceremonial life is a festival in which bulls, each kept penned in the family byre for many months, are urged to run free, only to be recaptured and restored to their stalls. On the next day, the beast is slaughtered. Here Hide villagers gather, the women in their dyed calabash hats. The bull festival celebrates the ancestors and brings honor too upon the family heads who can afford to purchase a bull, water and feed it to maturity. Women of the family dance, holding stones to boast of the weight of meat they will receive. Within the homestead, rites are made to protect the bull and its handlers. of the festival. It offers a formula for human action in a world in which all things are possessed of spirits. archetype of the spirits with whom people communicate through the medium of parts. This film is about people and their parts, and how some parts are tools that bind the physical and metaphysical worlds. The bull is forced back into its stall. They rejoice, strength and magic have triumphed. The crowd moves on to a bull run in the next compound, marked here among the Hide by a matting structure over the sacred pole raised in the courtyard of the ancestors. The next day, in the darkness of its byre and with little ceremony, the bull is butchered. <laughs> Pots are everywhere. They're used for cooking and as shrines. There are jars for the transport and storage of water and of beer. Most homesteads have a brewery. Food is served in burnished blackware. Pots have unexpected uses. Here, stopping up a granary. 
there as a beehive. Others express their owner's status. They're everywhere, on shelves, on altars, and in courtyards. Many relate to the spirit world. It is during the dry season when water is scarce and women wait long at the well that most pots are made. This is the village of Sirak. On a day in May, the late dry season of 1989. And the compound of Gobwai, an expert potter. Her workshop is a temporary shelter that will revert to field when the rains come. Her clay, dug nearby in a shallow pit, matures for days in a large pot. She wedges the clay by foot. Potters and smiths form a caste apart, the Ngualda. Zivai, Gobwai's husband, is a smith. He works in his forge, assisted by men of the other caste, the Vavai. Zavai can work with fire. Gobwai starts a pot by forming a cone of clay. Ground up pot sherds prevent it sticking. She tamps it into shape on an anvil mold carved from a tree trunk. Neighbors and friends stop by to chat. The potter's workshop is a social center during the enforced leisure of the dry season. I'm going to go to the 
Only so much of a pot can be formed by tamping. The top of the pot, it will be a beer jug, is built up of coils. The coils are carefully fused together. For the neck, a single clay collar. Children watch and learn. Within the compound, her granddaughter, Ndarna, is learning the craft. The base of a larger jar is formed by tamping on the anvil mold. It is then moved to a turntable. A bed of ashes holds it and keeps its form. Gawai builds up the body by coiling. The first thick coil is applied on the inside with a thinner one on the outside. The coils are pulled up and worked together. Someone provides a jug of millet beer, the local brew. After a prayer and libation, it is passed around and shared by all.
<laughs> then work resumes. Several pots are made at a time and built up in stages. Clay must be allowed to dry to prevent collapse under the pot's own weight. <laughs> Gobuai circles the pot to shape its rim. <laughs> the join between neck and body is strengthened by the addition of a thin coil. Various tools are used to decorate. Here Gobuai twists a roulette from a strip of palm frond. It is rolled over the pot to impress a band of decoration. Next, a handle. and applied pellets. A calabash fragment impresses another decorative band. The vessel surface is wetted and scraped. A belt of finger impressions added. With several bands of rouletting. And this storage jar is given breasts. While some pots receive a red wash, these are now complete, but before firing must dry out for days in the shade, protected from sheep and goats and children. Utilitarian pots are sold from the home or in the market, here at Makalo, Mafa Center. Blackware food bowls and redware cooking and storage pots are available in many shapes and sizes. <coughs> Quality is high and price is reasonable.
Housewives buy enough pots to last through the four-month rainy season. Homesteads are tight clusters of huts that disclose little of what goes on within. Once abandoned, their structure is revealed, a pattern of huts and courtyards, domed lofts and granaries. Built-in furnishings identify living and bedrooms and the kitchen. Pots are still stored in the rafters, and have been left on the grinding stand below. And so back to the other homestead, where the housewife, Wida, is about to make brine. Salt is too expensive. She puts ash made by burning sheep and goat dung in a colander pot with holes in its base. Water is added. She enters the compound. through a courtyard, to the husband's bedroom and family living room, and into the huts beyond. The colander is placed on a smaller pot that will collect the salty liquid used to flavor sauces and meat. In the kitchen, Wida adds measures of millet flour to water boiling in a cook pot. Next to this hearth is another, with huge vats plastered into place, in which she brews her beer. She stirs the millet grits to the right consistency. Men and boys are served and eat apart. Grits in a calabash, meat soup in a wooden bowl, sauce in the black bowl. Meat is a rarity, cooked only by men and on special occasions. It is distributed formally to women after men and then, with some exceptions, to boys and later girls in strict order of age. Potter's clay is also used in iron working. Crucibles are shaped for the welding of locally smelted iron. Bellows chambers are bowls set in a mass of mud plaster. 
Also of pottery are the bellows nozzles and the core of the tube that directs the air blast down into the firebox. De Quaza, a Mafa master smith, has filled the crucibles with iron fragments. A daughter-in-law works the bellows. He places a crucible in the firebox. iron is heated to incandescence. After compressing the iron in the crucible, De Quaza removes the pasty mass and welds it together. The crucible, broken and vitrified, is discarded. After reheating, the iron is drawn out into a short bar. Blackware, much less common than redware, is particularly associated with these smiths and potters, the Ngualda caste, who form less than 5% of the population. To achieve its high polish, it is rubbed with oil and burnished using pebbles and strings of beads or seeds. Like redware, it is fired in a shallow pit, with the pots laid on cakes of cattle dung. More dung is placed on and between the pots and straw or hay piled over. In the first stage of firing, enough air enters the fire for traces of iron in the clay to be oxidized. The pots become reddish in color. But when pulverized sheep and goat dung is dumped on the fire, most air is excluded. Not all the fuel can burn. Some carbon is deposited on the pots, producing a superb black luster. Once upon a time, two brothers decided who would be Ngualda and who Vavai by burying two green fruit. The one whose fruit ripened first would be Ngualda and would thenceforth smith, pot, and bury the dead. The future Ngualda's fruit ripened and blackened. In memory of this, the black pots are made to resemble the fruit. Thus, the wares echo the caste division. The Vavai's fruit turned red as it ripened. Red ochre is used to color the bodies of women and pots. Pots represent and indeed are people, and people 
pots. A hole in the lip of this funeral pot proclaims it a woman. <laughs> Turu, the main Hide center on market day. see a beer jug carried like a baby. In decoration, which gives magical protection, there are many parallels. Bands of various kinds decorate pots and people. Clay pellets represent grain and also necklace beads. Spiral motifs and twists associated with fertility take a variety of forms. They recur in the roulette and its impressions and in the bracelets worn by parents of twins. In social life, pots play a vital part, here at a Serac wedding party. Some, besides their instrumental function, mark social status. The tripod pot, its legs formed like horns, is associated with men. They use it for cooking all high-protein foods. In a terrace behind the homestead, a cluster of pots, upturned, half buried and pierced, testifies to a wife's childbearing. Each contains a placenta and is its grave, that of a boy baby in a tripod pot from which the legs have been broken. Pots for flour are similarly associated with women, and may be laid on their tombs. <laughs> Other pots register social achievements. Only Serac male elders who have celebrated the Gola feast have the right to these pots. They and others will continue to identify their former owners after death. Here, a Gola fragment on a Serac grave. Other pots speak of success in warfare and the need to placate the spirits of slain enemies, such as this one, a stirrup-spouted Madzagai. We enter the realm of the sacred. Damagai, a Mafa potter, is grinding potsherds. De Quaza, her husband, sits by an altar. On it, a pot representing God, Jigala, protector of the compound. Damagai is making another. Her technique resembles Gobois. She starts with the tamper and anvil mold. But she moves even small pots to a turntable and continues by coiling. At the join, first an inner coil, then a smaller outer one, 
that are pulled up and welded together. For a long while, the pot appears no different from any small jug. A neck is added and fused to the body. But now she adds an arm, the left arm, the hand of God and of man. This is a joint venture. De Quaza advises and shapes the fingers. Next, a magai adds spikes. These refer to cattle horns and penises and symbolize achievement, success, and potency. A boy brings leaves from a tree reserved for the use of the Ngwalda. One is used to form the rim. Next, Jigala's head is added. His beard indicated by rouletting. <laughs> and his hair, appropriately, by pellets that are also grain. After a band of decoration is impressed with a potter's comb and finishing touches, the pot is ready for firing, but is not yet sacred. Iron is being smelted in a traditional furnace. For this occasion, two gigale pots have been made. The Quaza prays and consecrates the first with gruel and an offering of flour. Then the second. Later in the smelt, he invokes Jigala's presence by prayer and by the sacrifice of a cock. Jigala will come to taste the blood and stay to guard the furnace and its servants. Oh, my God.
Jigala pots in various forms are installed outside traditional compounds and in many other places. Here we find one in a smith's forge. And here on a shelf with another sacred pot. Each mafa has a spirit double whose existence is intertwined with theirs and who on occasion requires placation. Dequaza says that this small jar, encrusted with offerings, was the home of his father's spirit double even before birth. His own rests on a shelf above his bed. When a person dies, their spirit lives on, continuing to play a part in the affairs of their descendants. Here a vessel, as yet unconsecrated, will represent a deceased father, but finds temporary use as a water pot. Once again, spikes represent horns. Zivai, the Serac smith, calls his father's spirit. He prays, offers beer, drinks himself, and gives communion to his family. His father will be moved by the offering to assist his son and protect against sorcerer's attacks and other dangers. Such pots represent father's and grandfather's generations. <laughs> Earlier forebearers have a collective address in a pot held in a clan shrine. Ceremonies held here express group identity and territorial rights. These pots are for the spirits of all those killed by clan members. Such shrines are located high on a mountain. One of the most potent spirits is that of millet, the staple grain and staff of life. Millet has a pot kept beneath the granary. Here one is seen with its mouth sealed to retain the spirit within and here another, mouth barred, for the same reason. Some spirits of disease are retained magically in pots that are dug into paths at night. The first passerby to step over the pot risks possession by the spirit and infection by the disease. To other disease spirits that live in trees, pot necks, tobacco and salt are offered. The bite of a lizard helps cure earache. Spirits have shrines everywhere. All can be influenced by prayer and offering and by magical means, to which must be added the raw human effort needed to achieve one's ends. At a funeral, person is transformed into ancestor and the spirit prepares to leave the body. On a lower terrace, the tomb is dug. Quarter by village quarter, the men, dressed for war, and the women, wailing, arrive to greet the widows. Men stay to chant and to beat the drums as the women dance.
The tomb is dug deeper, a side chamber carved out to receive the body. Women of the family cry out from the terraces. At last, the corpse is carried out. In the case of a rich man, it would be wrapped in the hide and wear the horns of a bull. An offering is made to the spirit still clinging to the vessel of his body. Then the corpse is lowered into the grave. As the body is the vessel of the spirit during life, and the grave holds for a while that of the deceased, so spirits can be caught and held in pots to do men's will before going forth again. So to the bull, penned in its buyer, restrained for years, yet has its moment of freedom, its wild run, before it is once more brought under human control. Look again at the bull festival and see it with new eyes, the bull as spirit. The bull is consecrated by flower thrown on its hump. The bull run, central to religious life, is a model, a paradigm of a world in which clan ancestors and individual strength and potency are the prerequisites for success. They celebrate the uniquely human prerogative to act on the world through the medium of spirit.